everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's Unstoppable Domains Partner Showcase. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. This segment and this session is about expansion into Asia Pacific and Europe for Unstoppable Domains. It's a hot startup in the Web3 area, really creating a new innovation around NFTs, crypto, single sign-on, and digital identity, giving users the power like they should. We've got two great guests, Ajad Rahman, head of Europe, and Neil Kanth, known as Neil Iyer, head of Asia. So John Neil, welcome to this cube, and let's talk about the expansion. It's not really expansion, the, the global economy is a global, but showcase here about Unstoppable's going to Europe. Thanks for coming on. Thanks John for inviting us. So we're living in a global world, obviously crypto, blockchain, decentralized applications. You're starting to see mainstream adoption, which means the shift is happening. There are more apps coming and it means more infrastructure and things got to get easier, right? So you know, reduce the steps it takes to do stuff, make the wallets better, give people more secure access and control of the day. This is what Unstoppable is all about. You guys are in the middle of it. You're on this wave. What is the potential of Web3 with Unstoppable and in general in Asia and in Europe? Um, I can go first. So, uh, no, let's look at the Asia market. I mean, uh, typically we see the US market, the Europe markets for typical Web 2.0, software and infrastructure is definitely the larger markets with us typically accounting for about 60 percent and uh, you know europe about 20 to 30 percent and asia has always been small uh, but we see in this whole world of blockchain crypto web 3.0 uh, asia already has about 160 million users uh, they have more than 35 local exchanges and if you really look at the number of countries in terms of the rate of adoption uh, many of the Asian countries, which probably you would have never even heard of, like Vietnam, actually topping the list, right? Uh, one of the reasons that this is happening, again, uh, if you go through the Asian Development Bank's latest report, uh, you have these Gen Zs and you know millennials, of that's 50% of the Asian population. And if you really look at 50% of the Asian population, that's 1.1 billion people out of the total 1.8 billion Gen Z and millennials that you have in the world. And these folks are digital native. They're people, in fact, the Gen Zs are mobile first and millennials, uh, many of us like myself at least, are you know, people who are digital. And 20% of the world's economy is currently digital. And the rest, 40 to 50%, which is going to happen, it's going to happen in the Web 3.0 world. And that's going to be driven by millennials and Gen Zs. I think that's why this whole space is so exciting because it's being driven by the users, uh, by the new generation. I mean, that's my broad thought on this yeah, whole thing. Before we get to say, I want to just comment on Asia also and the other areas where mobile first came, you had the, and the younger demographics absolutely driving the change because they're like, well, I don't want the old way. They go, they go right, right from scratch at the beginning, they're using the technologies that has propelled the crypto world. I mean, that is absolutely true. Uh, everyone's kind of seeing that. And that's now influencing some of these developer nations, like say in Europe, for instance, and even North America, I think Europe's more advanced than North America, in my opinion, but uh, we'll get to that. Oh, so potential in Europe. So John, take us yeah. through your thoughts on as head of Europe for-, for Absolutely. Um, so Neil's right. I think Asia's way ahead in terms of Gen Z users adopting crypto. I, it's, Europe is actually a distant second, but it's surprising to note that Europe actually has the highest transactional activity in crypto. Uh, over the last year and a half. And you know, if you dig a bit deeper, I, I'd say arguably for Europe, I think the opportunity in Web3 is perhaps the largest and perhaps it can mean the most for Europe. Europe over the last decade has been trailing behind Asia and North America when it comes to birthing unicorns. And I think Web3 can provide a step change opportunity. This belief for me stems from the fact that Europe's policy, right? Uh, like for example, GDPR, is focused on enabling zero data ownership. And I think I recently read a very good paper out of Stanford by Patrick Henson, where he speaks about Web3 being the best pathway for Europe enabling digital sovereignty. So what that means is users control the data they bring to the internet and they harness the value from it. And on one hand, while you know Europe is enabling that regulation that, that can bring that forth, Web3 actually brings it into action. So I think with more enablement, better regulation, uh, and we'll see more uh, hubs like the Crypto Valley in, in Switzerland pop up. That will bring, I think, I, and I'd be capable here to say, not over regulation, the right regulation. We can expect more inflow capital, more builder talent that then drives more adoption 
So I think the prospects for Europe in terms of usage as well as uh, builders is, are quite bright. Yeah, and I think also you guys are in areas where the cultural shift is so dramatic. You mentioned Asia, the demographics, even the entrepreneurial culture in Europe right now is booming. You look at all the, the venture-backed startups and the young generation building companies. And again, cloud computing is a big part of that as, as, as obviously, but look at compared to the United States, you go back 15 years ago, Europe was way behind on, on the startup scene. Now it's booming and pumping on all cylinders and kind of points at this cultural shift. It's almost like a, a generational, you know, it's like the digital hippies changing the world, you know, the web three, it's kind of, I don't want to be web two, web two is so old, you know, I don't want to do that. And it, it's all because it's changing, right? And there are things inadequate with web two on the naming system. Also the arbitrage around fake information, bots, users being manipulated and also, you know, merchandised and monetized through these portals. Okay, that's, that's kind of ending. So talk about the dynamic of web two, three, at those areas, you got users and you got companies who build applications, they're going to shift and be forced in our opinion. And I want to get a reaction to that. Do you think applications are going to have to be web three or users will reject them? Yeah, I think uh, I, I'll jump in and I'd love to hear Neil's thought. I think uh, the, the web three is built on a few principles, right? There's decentralization, ownership uh, and composability. And I think these are not binary. So, you know, if, if I look further out in the future, I don't see a, a, a future where you have just Web3. I think there's going to be a coexistence or cooperation between Web2 companies, Web3, and there'll be bridges. I think there's going to be, there's a sliding scale to decentralization versus centralization, similarly, you know, ownership. And I think users will find what works best for them in different contexts. Um, I think what Unstoppable is doing is essentially providing the identity system for Web3. And that's way more powerful when it comes to being built on blockchains uh, than the, the naming system we had for Web2, right? The, the identity system can serve the purpose of taking a universal identifier as your blockchain domain name and attaching all kinds of attributes that define who you are both in the physical and digital world and then filling out information that you can transact on the basis of. And I think the users would as the, as we go to a no code and low code future, right? Where, you know, in web two, more of the users were essentially uh, consumers or uh, or readers of the internet. And in web three, with, with more low code and no code technology platforms taking uh, shape and, and, and getting proliferation, uh, you would see more users being actually writers, uh, uh, publishers and developers on the internet. And they would value owning their data and to harness the most amount of value from it. So, I think uh, that's the power concept, and I think that's the future I see that that Web3, where Web3 will dominate. Um, Neil, what do you think? Well, I think you put it very, very nicely, Sajad. I think you covered most of the points. I think, but I'm seeing a lot of uh, different things that are happening in the ground. I think a lot of the governments, a lot of the Web2.0 players, the traditional banks, uh, these guys are not sitting quiet on the blockchain space. There are a lot of pilots happening in the blockchain space, right? I mean, I, I can give you real life, you know, examples. I mean, one of the biggest example is in my home state of Maharashtra, where Mumbai is. Uh, they actually partnered with uh, Polygon Matic, right? Uh, actually built a private blockchain based uh, capability to, you know, kind of deliver your uh, COVID vaccination certificates with the QR code, right? And that's the only way they could deliver that kind of volumes in that short a time with the kind of uh, user uh, control, the user control the user has on the data that could only be possible because of blockchain. Of course, it's still private because it's healthcare data. You know, they still want to keep it, uh, you know, something that's not fully on a blockchain, mm -hmm. but that is something. Uh, similarly, we, there is a consortium of about nine banks uh, who have actually been trying to work on making things like remittances, or, you know, trade finance much, much easier. I mean, remittances through a traditional web 2.0 world is very, very costly. And especially in the Asian countries, a lot of people from Southeast Asia work uh, across the world and send back money home. It's a very costly and a time-taking affair. Uh, so they have actually partnered and built a blockchain based capability again in a pilot stage to kind of reduce the transaction costs. Like for example, if you just look at the trade finance space where there are 40 million traders who do $2.45 trillion of transaction, uh, they were able to actually reduce 
the time that it takes from eight to nine days to about two to three days. Uh, so to add on to what you're saying, I think these two worlds are going to meet and meet very soon. And when they meet, what they need is a single digital identity, a human readable a way of being able to send and receive and do commerce. I think that's where I see unstoppable domains very nicely positioned to be able to integrate these two worlds. So that's that's my thought on top. That was of a great point. I was going to get into which industries and kind of what areas you see in your air, uh, in geographies, but it's a good point about saving time. I like how you brought that up because in these new waves, you either got to reduce the steps it takes to do something, or save time, make it easy. And these are the, this is the successful formula of, in anything, whether it's an app or UI or whatever. But what specifically are they doing in your areas? And, and what about um, Unstoppable, are they attracted to? Is it because of the identity? Is it because of the, the apps? Is it because of the single sign-on? What, what is the reason that they're leaning in and unpacking this further into their pilots? Sajad, do you want to take that? Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah. Okay. I, I'm happy to please jump in if, if you want to. Uh, so I think, uh, and, and let me clarify the question, John. You're, you're talking about Web2 companies looking to partner in software or potential partnerships, right? Yeah, what are they seeing? And what are they seeing as the value? That these pilots we heard from Neil Kanth around the, the, the financial industry, and obviously gaming's one that's obvious, huge. Financial, healthcare, I mean, these are obviously verticals that are going to be heavily impacted in a positive way. Where, what are they seeing as the value? What's getting them motivated to do these pilots? Why are they, why are they jumping in uh, with, with both feet, if you will, on these projects? Is it because yeah. it's saving money? Is it time? Uh, what or, or both? Is it ease of use? Is it the is it the users' expectations? I'm trying to tease out how you guys see that evolving. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the the it, this is still it, the space is the movement is going very fast, but I think the space is still young. And right now, a lot of these companies are seeing the potential that Web three offers, and I think the key key dimensions right composability, decentralization, ownership. So I think the key uh, thing I'm seeing in EU is these Web2 companies seeing the momentum and looking to harness that by enabling bridges to Web3. One of the key trends in Europe has been FinTech, I think over the last five to six years, where you have the Revolut, N26, um, uh, eToro, the creating platforms, new banks, and, and, and super finance, super apps uh, rising to the forefront. And they are all enabling or sort of connecting a bridge with Web3 in some shape and form, either enabling trading of crypto, some are launching their own native wallets. Uh, and these are essentially ways that they can one, attract users. So the Gen Z who are looking for more frictional finance to get them on board, but also to look to you know enable uh, more uh, ad adoption by their own users who are not using these services that potentially create new revenue streams and deploy and create allocation of capital that they could not access to have access to otherwise. So I think that's one trend I'm seeing over here. I think the other key trend is uh, in, in Europe at least has been games. And again, that links to a dimension of Web3 that is called the metaverse. So a lot of game companies uh, are looking to step into GameFi, uh, which is again, completely different business model to what traditional game companies used to use. Similarly, metaverses where again, ownership creates a different business model. And they see that users and gamers of the future would want to engage with that versus just being monetized on the basis of subscription or or ads, and and I think that's something that they're you know becoming aware of and moving quickly in the space, launching their own metaverses or uh, or or game by applications or creating interoperability with these uh, these decentralized applications. You know, I wanted to get into this point, but I was going to ask about the community empowerment piece of this equation because digital identity is about the user's identity, which implies they're part of a community. Web3 is very community centric, but you mentioned gaming. I mean, people who have been watching the gaming world like ourselves know that communities and marketplaces have been very active for years, many years, you know, over 15 years, community, you know, games, currency, in-game activity <laughs> has been out there, right? but siloed within the games themselves. So now it seems that that paradigm's coming in and empowering all communities. Is this something that you guys see and agree with? And if so, what's different about that? What, how, are, how, are, how are communities being empowered? I guess that's the question. Yeah, I can maybe take that Sajad. So, uh, I mean, I must have heard of Axie Infinity. I mean, 40% of their user base is in Vietnam. 
and the average earning that a person makes in a month uh, out of playing this game is more than the you know national daily or you know minimum wage that is there right so that's the kind of potential actually going back uh, as a combination of uh, actually answering your earlier question and i think over and above what sajad said what's very unique in asia is we still have a lot of unbanked uh, people right yeah. so if you really look at the total unbanked population of the world it's 1.6 billion and 24% of that is in asia so almost 375 million people uh, are in asia so these are people who do not have access uh, to finance for credit uh, so the whole idea is how do we get these people on to a banking system on to peer you know, peer to peer lending uh, or you know peer to peer finance kind of capabilities i think uh, you know again Uh, unstoppable domains kind of helps in that right if you just look at the pure web 3.0 world and the complex you know technical way in which you know money or other you know crypto is transferred from one wallet to the other uh, it's it's very difficult for an unbanked person who probably cannot even uh, do basic communication cannot read and write to actually be able to do it but something that's very human readable something that's very easy for him to understand something that's visual something that he can see on his mobile uh, with a uh, in a 2g network we are not talking of you know, the world is talking about 5g but there are parts of asia which are still uh, using 2g and you know 2.5g kind of network right so i think that's one key use case i think the banks are trying to solve because for them this is a whole new customer segment uh and sorry i actually went back a little bit to your earlier question but you know coming back uh, to this whole community building right uh, so uh, on march 8th uh, we are launching something called as women of web 3.0 that is wow 3 right this is basically to again empower so if you again look at asia uh, you know women uh, you know need a lot of training they need a lot of enablement for them to be able to leverage the power of you know web 3.0 uh hello uh, i can talk about india because being from india a lot of the women uh, you know do not you know they they do all the you know small businesses uh, but the money is you know taken by middlemen or taken by their husbands uh, with you know web 3.0 fundamentally the money comes to them because that's what they use to educate their children and it's the same thing in a lot of other southeast asian countries as well i think uh, it's very important to build those communities uh, communities of women entrepreneurs uh, i think uh, this is a big opportunity to really get the section of society which probably you know will take 10 more years if we go through the normal web 1 to web 2.0 progression yeah. where the power is with corporations and not with the individuals so. and that's a great announcement by the way you mentioned the 10 million dollars worth of domains being issued out uh, for this is democratization is what it's all about again this is you know a, a new revolution i mean this is a, a new thing so great stuff more education more learning and got to get the banks up and running get those people banking because once they're banking they get wallets right so they need the wallets so let's get to the real meat here you guys are in the territory europe and asia where there's a lot of wallets there's a lot of exchanges because that's they're not in the united states there's a few of them there uh, but most of them outside the united states and you got a lot of d apps developing um, you know decentralized applications Okay, so you got all this coming together in your territory. What's the strategy? Is that what's the strategy? How are you going to attack that? You got the wallets, you got the exchanges, and you got D applications, D apps. Yeah, I'm I'm having to prepare for this fast. So I think, uh, and just quickly there, I think one point is and Neil really expressed it beautifully is the financial inclusion. That that is something that has been inspired me. How Web three can make internet more inclusive. That inspired my move here. um yeah i think uh for for us i think when it a bit at the base start when it comes to europe right and uh, uh the the key focus in 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 terms of uh, our approach in europe would be that we want to do two things one we want to increase the utility of these domain names and the second thing is we want to drive proliferation with 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 our partners so when i speak about utility i think utility is when you have a universal identifier which is a domain name and then you have these attributes around it right what what that defines your identity 
So in uh, in the context in, in Europe, we would look to find partners who help us enrich that identity around the domain name. And that adds value for users in terms of acquiring these domains and utilizing them. And on the other end, when it comes to proliferation, I think it's about working with uh, all those crypto and crypto and Web3 Web3 participants as well as Web3 adjacent companies, brands, services who can help us educate uh, 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 current and future and upcoming uh, Web3 users about the utility of domain names and help us onboard them to the, to the decentralized internet. So I think that's going to be the general focus. I think the key is that uh, uh, as ho and hopefully, you know, we have one overarching regulation in the EU that allows us to do this at a region level. But at the outset, I think it's going to be tackling it country by country, uh, identifying countries where there's deeper penetration uh, for Web3, and then making sure that we are partnering with local trusted partners that are already developing for uh, local communities there. So yeah, that's that's my view, and we will happy to please do those awards in for. No, I think uh, yeah. So again, in Asia. You know, one is you have a, a significant part of humanity living in Asia, right? So obviously, and obviously all the other challenges and the opportunities that we talk about. I think the first area of focus would be, uh, you know, educating the people on the massive opportunity that they can, you know, they have. And if you're able to get them in early, I think it's great for them as well, right? Uh, uh, you know, because by the time, you know, governments, regulations, you know, large banking financial companies move, but if you can get the larger population, uh, you know, into this whole space, uh, it, it's good for them. So they are first movers in that space. I think uh, we're doing a lot of things on this worldwide. I think we have done more than a hundred podcasts, just educating people on what is Web3.0, you know, what is what are NFT domains, what is you know, DeFi, and you know, so on and so forth. I think it would need uh, some bit of localization, customization in Asia, given that. Uh, you know, India itself has about 22 languages, and then there are the other countries, which each, each of them uh, with their own local languages and uh, you know syntax, semantics, and all those things. Right? So I think that that is very important to be able to disseminate the knowledge, uh, though it's it's global. But I think to get the grassroots people to understand the opportunity, I think it it would need some amount of work there. Uh, I think also building communities. I think John, you talked about communities. So did Sajad talk about communities. I think it's very important to build uh, communities because communities create ideation. It talks about uh, people share their challenges so that people don't repeat the same mistakes. Uh, so I think it's very important to build communities based on interest. I think we all know in the technology world, you can build communities around Telegram, Telegram, Discord, uh, Twitter spaces and all those things. But, you know, again, when you're talking of financial inclusion, you're talking of a different kind of, you know, community building. I think that that would be important. And then, of course, I will, you know, kind of uh, primarily from a company perspective, I think uh, getting the 35 odd, uh, you know, exchanges in Asia, the wallets, uh, to partner with us, uh, just as an example, uh, you know, um, uh, Matic, uh, you know, they had till uh, September of last year about 3,500 apps. In just one quarter, it doubled to 7,000 apps on their platform. But that is the pace or the you know speed of innovation that we are seeing on this whole you know 3.0 space. I think it's very important to get those key partners uh, who are developing those apps. Uh, see the power of you know single sign-on, uh, having a human-readable digital identity, being able to seamlessly transfer uh, your assets, digital assets across multiple cryptos, across multiple uh, you know NFT uh, you know, marketplaces, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, and I think the whole community thing too is also you see the communities being part of certainly in the entertainment area and the artistry uh, uh, creator world. The users are part of the community, they own it too. So it goes both ways, but this brings up the marketplace too as well, because you ha you guys have the opportunity to have trust built into the software layer, right? So now yep. you can keep the reputation data. You don't, you can be anonymous, but it's trustworthy versus bots, which we all know bots can be killed and then started again with, <laughs> and no one knows what, you know, that's how long it's been around. So you know, the whole inadequacy of web two, which is just growing pains, right? This is what it'll evolution looks like, you know, next abstraction layer. So I love that vibe. Um, how advanced do you think um, that 
thinking is, where people are saying, hey, we need this abstraction layer, we need this digital identity, we need to start expanding our applications so that the users can move across these and break down those silos where the data is. Because that's, this is like the nerd, nerd problem, right? It's the data silos that, that are holding it back. What's your guys' reaction to that? The, the killing the silos so, and making it horizontal yeah. and scalable? Yeah, I think it's it's a nerd problem. It is a problem of people who understand technology. It's a problem of a lot of the people in the business who want to compete effectively against those giants which are holding all the data. Uh, so I think those are the people who will innovate and move. Uh, again, coming back to financial inclusion, coming back to the unbanked, I mean, those guys you know, just want to do their business. They want to live their daily life. I think that's not where you will see you will see innovation in a different form, but they're not going to disrupt the disruptors. Uh, I think that would be uh, the people, you know, fintechs, I think they would be the first to move on to something like that. I mean, that's my humble opinion. You know. Sajad, yeah, I, I think, go ahead. Final yeah, absolutely. Word. I think, I mean, I, I touch on creators, right? So, and like I said earlier, right, we are heading for a future where more people will be creators on the internet, whether you're publishing, uh, writing something, you're creating video content, and that means that they, the data they own, because that's their data, they bring it to the internet, that's more powerful, more useful, and they should be able to project on that basis. So I think people are recognizing that and they will increasingly look to do so. And as they do that, they would want these systems that enable them to hold permissions with data. They would want to be able to control what the permission and what they want to provide, adapt. And at the end of the day, you know, um, uh, these applications have to work backwards from customers. And if the customer is looking for uh, with that, then, then that's where, that's what, what they will build. The users want freedom. They want to be able to be connected and not be restricted. They want to freely move around the global internet and do whatever they want with the friends and apps that they want to consume and not feel arbitraged. They don't want to feel like uh, they're kind of nailed into a you know walled garden and you know stuck there and having to come back, yeah. it's, the, it's the new normal. They don't Absolutely. want to be the, they don't want to be the product, right? So they don't want to be the product. <laughs> Gentlemen, yeah. great to have you on, great conversation. We're going to continue this uh, later. Certainly want to keep the updates coming. You guys are in a very hot area in Europe and Asia Pacific. That's where a lot of the action is happening. We see the entrepreneurial activity, the business transformation, certainly with the new paradigm shift and this big wave that's coming. It's here, it's mainstream. Thanks for coming on and sharing your insights. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks John, thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Have a good day. Great conversation. All the action is moving and happening real fast. This is theCUBE, Unstoppable Domains Partner Showcase with, I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.